So a couple of weeks ago, as we are starting to get in the habit of new school and, and getting everything going, the first time that Sarah was able to go with me to the bus stop to pick up the kids at the, at the end of the day was on a Friday. She's off on Friday and I'm off on Friday. And so we're walking. So you come out of our house and you turn left and you go all the way to the end. And once you get to the, get to the corner, you have to cross the street and go down a little ways. And that's where the bus stop is. So as we get there to the corner, right? We've been walking and we've been talking. Everything's wonderful. Everything's great. I start to walk across the street right there. And she stops right there on the sidewalk because she's turning this way. And, she, and I get about three steps in the street and she goes, what are you doing? And I look and I go, I'm crossing the street. And I say, because we have to cross the street, the, the bus stop is up there. And she says, why don't you just cross the street right across the street from where the bus stop is? And I said, because this is the corner. This is the place that you cross the street. <laughs> and she gave me this look. Maybe you, maybe you know this look. This look like... You are hopelessly and helplessly square and will always just follow whatever rule there possibly is. <laughs> but mixed with, you're my soulmate and I love you forever. Like you, it was this sort of mixture. You could feel both of them at the same time. And I gave her a look back. Like, you just want anarchy where people are just fighting in the streets over food. But 10 years feels like one minute because I love you with all of my soul. You know woven together. And she goes, why are you, why are you doing this? Because this is where you cross the street. And she goes, Ugh, rules. And walks down the sidewalk and then just crosses over right where she wants to. And I, not losing eye contact, cross over right where I am going and then make the turn and walk. And that's what we do. And uh, this is played out in about 8 million times every day in our house because, um, and, and maybe my experience is this sort of fits most people because most people, when it comes to rules, you have a default setting in you and it's put there by all sorts of kinds of different things. And the default setting is either it's a rule, so I'm going to follow it. And that's the default setting. Now there are some rules, obviously, that you break or do differently, but the default setting is there's a rule and I'm going to follow it. Then there's other people. <laughs> and their default setting is prove to me this rule is worth me following and I might follow it. Might follow it. Otherwise, if I think this rule is silly, dumb, worthless, unimportant, if I can't understand why this rule matters, I'm going to do the opposite just because. I like to watch the world burn, is what they say. Uh, and uh, so you have these two sort of jarring fights about what you do and how you handle rules. And while, while it's one thing whether you're going to cross right at the so sidewalk like civilized people or just be barbarians and cross wherever and put your life and your children's life at risk, either is fine, right? But um, no, no, see... <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't hear you back there, love of my life, who's part of my heart. <laughs> yeah. You agree with me? I, I know, yeah, I love you too. So, um, anyway, uh, that's what she said. She said, you're 100% right and I'm wrong. Uh, but don't ask her, don't turn around, don't ask her. But you have these two sort of headbutting opinions kind of on how you deal with rules. And while we may not think about it, we run into rules all over the place. And, and we run into this sort of issue all over the place. I mean, the, the rules the government puts on us are laws. The rules that jobs put on us about when we're coming or what we're doing. The rules that relationships put on us of here's what we're going to do and here's, here's how we are going to navigate what this looks like. Who does the dishes in your family? How does that exactly work? Is it just whoever happens to be closest to the sink when they all sort of fall over and you have to catch them before they crash on the floor, that means you're the one who has to do the dishes? Or is there somebody who knows, okay, the other person's going to get annoyed if I just keep leaving these dishes and they'll eventually do it. No, no, don't look, don't look. Don't, I don't want to create problems. But you know, there's, you figure out the rules and the rules can be all sorts of different things. And... Honestly, as much as I joke, both sides are needed. 
Because the people who follow rules, rules in their best possible form, are guardrails that people who have gone before us have put up. There, is a, there should be a rule about not touching a hot stove with your hand. Because that's a bad idea. It's going to hurt, right? These are guardrails. The, the very first person who touched a hot stove with his hand went, Ow, don't do that anymore. That's no good. They are, in their best sense, these are guardrails that help us learn from the mistakes of others so that our experience isn't affected and, and hurt, set back by these mistakes that other people have made, right? So following rules in the best possible sense of rules helps you to get there and, make, and, and helps you to get to where you want to go more safely, better, more easily. But if all we ever do is follow rules then we miss out on what the adventure could be. We miss out on what we may be meant to do that everybody else is going this way, but God may very well be calling you to go this way. There's all sorts of danger and adventure and hope, and there is a piece of us, even the most rule-following rule-follower, there is a piece of us that is wired to like to hear stories about people who don't follow the rules, right? Every single other crime procedural on TV is what? The no-nonsense cop, generally a female, no-nonsense cop, and then the wacky guy who doesn't follow the rules but has some sort of weird habit or tick or whatever. He's a stamp collector or a you know, shark diver or whatever. And they, you know, it shouldn't work, but the two of them together solve crimes every week, right? Because there is this piece, this, this guy who does it differently or girl who does it differently, this person who doesn't follow the rules, there is a piece of us that that adventure flares up in us and we love. It is both of these sides of us that are necessary. And when we go so far over on this side, it is anarchy. And we don't have, you know, as, as much as the non-rule following people may not like to follow rules, they probably still like it when, you're, when your house is on fire, if the rules are followed, that somebody shows up and helps put it out. Right? It probably is, they probably are pretty happy that there are rules about when you flip the switch, the lights come on and the heat works, and the bills are paid, and those kinds of things matter. So there are pieces of us that, that draw from both sides, and the problem is when we veer off to one side or veer off to the other, we miss the message and the meaning and the purpose behind what rules are supposed to do and how we are supposed to relate to them. So this is not a new problem. And this uh, connects very strongly to what we've been talking about over these last few weeks with Sabbath. What we, what we have talked about over the last couple of weeks is this idea of Sabbath that was introduced by Moses in the Ten Commandments in two different places in the Old Testament. You have the Exodus passage where part of the Ten Commandments are, you will honor and obey the Sabbath. Now, what's interesting is if, if I were to ask you, does God want you to do the Ten Commandments? And you'd say, sure, absolutely. And then I would say to you, so God doesn't want you to kill people. Well, clearly. God wants you only to worship God. Well, clearly. Okay, so God wants you to keep the Sabbath. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's, this is the commandment we sort of go, okay. Okay, maybe nine and a half. Like, sure, I'll, I'll you know, the, we don't see it as some sort of imperative for us. But what if this is God's idea and God's ideal that we set apart this time? That this time helps us to rest because we are all moving so quickly. We are all in this culture that continues to speed up faster and faster and faster and faster and faster and faster and faster, and faster so that you have no time to even think about what you're doing. You are just moving from one loud thing to another loud thing to another loud thing, and then you have to somehow collapse into your bed and exhaustedly just fall asleep until the alarm rings and you do it all over again. 
that's what the world is that we live in. Sabbath is an intentional choice that we are going to stop. We are going to rest. In resting, we have a chance to actually reflect. We have a chance to, to actually think about what it is we're doing and why we're doing it. And in Sabbath, we have a chance to rejoice. We rejoice both in God, whether you come here and worship, whether it's Bible study, whether it's however it is for you and whatever you, you figure that out, you worship God, but you also worship and celebrate, you don't worship, you celebrate those things that God has created. You rejoice in how God has made you and how God has gifted you and you find that thing that gives gives you life. That thing that causes you to lose track of time because you're having so much fun doing it. Whether it's gardening or reading or whatever it is, Sabbath is set apart time that you do this stuff so that you remember you are more than what you do. You remember you are more than what you produce. You are more than the money you make. You are worthy to just be because God's in control and God loves you. We talked about that the first week. The last week, we talked about Mary and Martha. And we talked about part of what Sabbath does is it reminds us that time is just not another resource like money that we see and we just sort of see draining out and we just have to figure out what's the best life hack we can do so that we can use time to be as productive as possible. What time is and what time has the opportunity to be is this sacred space where all of a sudden, God is there. Sabbath creates this kind of sacred space. It transforms time. So, this kind of wrestling with what you do and how you do it is what the Jewish people were doing since Moses got done talking about all of these things. And they had to wrestle with what it means because even though at times, growing up, I had a really hard time, this may sound silly, but I think you'll know what I mean. I had a really hard time seeing people in the Bible as real people. They sort of felt like, um, you know, cardboard cut out holy characters, right? Like, uh, you know, what, they don't eat breakfast, right? They just sit around and think holy things and do holy stuff. You know, any sort of close reading of the Bible and you're like, oh, well, that's not right. But, but that's sort of the impression you get there in the Bible. I'm not. But these were real people who dealt with real things and felt real stuff. And so there were people who said, okay, Moses, that Sabbath thing's great, but what about, right? But what about this? What about that? So all of the Jewish leaders had to come up with all of these rules, all of these explanations, all of these addendums that, came, that went on to what that Sabbath thing meant. And it got to the point that there were 39 different definitions of work, of things you could not do. Included in the definitions of work, you want to talk about expansive and, uh, and you know, trying to reach every possible thing. There was a definition of work that was miraculous healing. Can you imagine having to create a definition? Who wants to be on that committee, right? Like, uh, so what if Earl starts miraculously healing people? Can he do that on the Sabbath? Yeah, that sounds like work. All right, Earl, you got to wait till Monday before you miraculously heal people, okay? I mean, you can do it Saturday up until sundown, but, you know, after that, you got to stop, okay? Miraculous healing was considered work. So you have all of these rules and all of these structures and all of this stuff built up of what Sabbath was and Sabbath meant, and Jesus shows up right in the middle of it. And all of these religious people have something to say to him. So if you would, would you turn with me to our scripture for today? It is Matthew chapter 12. So Matthew chapter 12, starting in verse 1. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry and began to pick some heads of grain and to eat them. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to him, now mine here has an exclamation point, to give the impression and the indication that they're not saying, oh, hey, look, by the way, they are in full tattletale mode. You ready? Look, your disciples are doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath. 
Okay, there are very few things in this Jewish culture at this time that are worse. Okay? You are breaking Sabbath. You are breaking one of the Ten Commandments. You, as the teacher, are responsible for your disciples, your students. Do you know what they're doing? They're hoping, obviously, to trap Jesus. They're hoping Jesus is mortified and goes, oh, I can't believe they're doing this. This is ridiculous. Why on earth are they doing this? Stop it, guys! Let's see what Jesus does. He answered, haven't you read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He entered the house of God, and he and his companions ate the consecrated bread, which was not lawful for them to do, but only for the priests. Or haven't you read in the law that on the Sabbath, the priests in the temple desecrate the day and yet are innocent? I tell you that one greater than the temple is here. If you had known what these words mean, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the innocent. For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Okay, this is not the answer they were expecting. And because what he said and what he does is he takes these super religious people and he uses our Old Testament, their Bible, and quotes their Bible back to them and says, I, I guess you must have just forgotten in all of your Bible reading, these examples of what was going on. And, oh, by the way, I'm in charge of everything, so I'm the one who gets to set the rules about the Sabbath. And the Pharisees went, oh, good point. Okay, that's fine. Go ahead. No, wait, I don't think they actually did that. Yep, that's not right. Verse 9. Going on from that place, he went into their synagogue, and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, they asked him, Hey, uh, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? Now, we, remember, we already know this answer. Earl wanted to do miraculous healings on the Sabbath, and we had to keep telling him, No, settle down, Earl. You can't do miraculous healings on the Sabbath. Why is that? Because you, to do the miraculous healing, would require you to do work. The specific written out ex explanation of this is you have six days of the week to do miracles. Take the Sabbath off. Now that's banana pants. Like that's just, that's just nutso. So Jesus knows exactly what is happening here. Verse 11, he said to them, if any of you has a sheep and it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will you not take hold of it and lift it out? So the Pharisees, this was actually a question, by the way. Uh, there was a much more hardline group of, of religious uh, Jews at this time, and they would have said, yeah, you just leave it to die, it's fine. It's the Sabbath. But the Pharisees were the more moderate group. The Pharisees said, no, this is God's creation. Of course you would pull it out and save it. Of course you would rescue it on the Sabbath. So Jesus says, how much more valuable is a man than a sheep? Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. So he stretched it out, and it was completely restored, just as sound as the other. But the Pharisees went out and plotted how they might kill Jesus. So, there's a lot going on here. But part of, uh, part of what I want you to see is that for many of us, Sabbath is not a practice we do, and we're trying to figure out what the pieces look like. What, what we have here is an example of so far on the other side that they have missed the boat in their own way, where oftentimes we miss the boat by thinking there's no way we could possibly even do Sabbath. It doesn't fit in my world. This isn't, you know, there's just, my life is too busy. I can't handle this. For them, they couldn't envision not doing Sabbath, but they have done Sabbath and done it in their cultural way with their cultural rules for so long that they have missed the meaning behind what's going on. They've missed the meaning and the message of what Sabbath is supposed to be. That's why they are cold-hearted enough that they can try and use Sabbath to trap Jesus to figure out how to kill him, right? Sabbath is a reminder of us that we belong to God, is a reminder that we aren't what we do. It's a reminder that God is in control of everything. And what the Pharisees are using is Sabbath to use the rules to try and trap Jesus. Because for them, the only rule that matters 
is that they get rid of Jesus. Everything else goes underneath that. Right now, the only thing that matters is that they get rid of Jesus. You see this all the time. You see it... Uh, you see it everywhere. You see it in our politics. You see people who come on TV and say things that are patently ridiculous, and you can even read in their face, they think it's ridiculous, but you got to beat the other side. So they're going to say what they need to say so that our side wins and your side loses. Because in that sense, the only rule that matters is that our side wins, not that what you're saying is ridiculous and everyone's looking at you going, you know this is ridiculous, right? So... What the Pharisees care about is beating Jesus. And so they are trying to trap Jesus in this thing. And what Jesus says is, listen, mercy is more important than sacrifice. That's another part of the Bible you Pharisees didn't quite get. You may want to go back and read that again. Mercy is more important than sacrifice. The point of Sabbath isn't that we create a whole new set of rules and create a whole new structure of something we can't do, and if we do it wrong, God's going to be mad at us, and we better, we better make sure we do it right and go through the right steps and figure the right things out. That's not the point. The point of Sabbath is to dwell in this presence that once a week we stop and we remember what really matters. We remember what really is important. We weave ourselves back into the story of God and we are reformed and reshaped and remade by that good news every single time. What the Pharisees are interested in doing is trapping Jesus. They have the law on their side. Jesus shouldn't be healing people on the Sabbath. He's got six days to do that. Come back tomorrow. Jesus says, don't you get it? The Sabbath is about restoring and reconnecting you to the way that you're supposed to be. There's nothing more Sabbath-y than a person who is broken finding healing. There is nothing more Sabbath-y than somebody who is away being brought back closer to God. That's what Sabbath does, is it takes us from our disconnected state and brings us closer to God. So, the Sabbath rules that we choose to follow are rules that need to serve like guidelines, need to serve like guardrails, so that we can see, if we make it all about ourselves, we're going to fall off the cliff this way. If we don't do anything, we're just going to let culture continue to shape and form us and warp our souls, and we'll go that way. These guardrails keep us where we need to be, in the right place, in the right way. You, you follow them as best you can with the lead of the Holy Spirit. So all this is great and good, but what on earth does this have to do with us as we're trying to figure out Sabbath here and now? How does this work? And I say to you, part of how this works is it has to be something like jazz music. This is not rigorous music where you have, to, you have to follow every single note and you follow it exactly, otherwise everything is completely thrown off. In jazz, you focus on improvisation. You go and you move where you, the Spirit leads and you follow as best you can using all of the structures you've learned, using all the rules you know. You follow and go what you need to and where you need to and how you need to. You, you move within this realm and figure out what works so that together this sound of all the people you're playing with works together. So, as you and your family are figuring out what Sabbath means for you, it's going to require a lot of experimentation. There are going to be times where you try something, and you go, nope, this is horrible, and we're never doing this again. Right? There are going to be times where you try something, and one small tweak that you would have never thought about to begin with, but because you're trying it, and you do one small tweak, suddenly everything opens up, and this is exactly what you need to do. You practice Sabbath and you use the rules that, that we come up with. You use the rules of how people are understanding and living Sabbath now, not as the structure that binds you, but as the guardrails that keeps you from falling off the side on either way. That's what these rules do is they help you. So some of these rules are, it's a whole day. And part of why it's a whole day is because it takes time to unwind from the speed that you live in. Just like the first couple of days of vacation take, aren't really vacation because you're still trying to wear off from the speed of your normal life, Sabbath as a day gives you time to actually get there, to actually stop, to actually breathe.
You rest and you rejoice and you figure out and you reflect. You stop and think about and work with, no, this doesn't work or this works. You do these things because it is worth the effort. It is worth the frustration. It is worth the failure. And you use these rules as helpful guides, as shortcuts in some ways. And when they don't work, you break them. You go off the side and do what God is leading you to. Because there is no one right way that we do Sabbath. God has made your family unique in this place, in this moment, and I can't tell you how to do it. On Wednesday nights, we gather together and we talk through all the different pieces, and some of you say to me, and I understand this because I'm the same kind of person, okay, okay, what if I only do it like this and this and this, and the heart behind it is, I don't think I can do it fully, I think I just need to do this and this and this and this and this. And I say to you, I've said it every Wednesday night, and I'll say it every Sunday morning, I'm not the Sabbath cops. I'm not going to show up at your house and tell you you're doing it wrong. This is how you and your family are trying to make a commitment so that God is more fully present and filled. And think about this. What would it be like after you get through this initial struggle, what would it be like if you had one day every week that you weren't overwhelmed? One day every week that you could think about God? One day every week you could think? One day every week that you looked forward to because something wonderful, something that filled you with joy was going to happen? And you did all that you needed to do so that one day could be every single week. That's what God invites you to with Sabbath. And we can, we can throw all the rules out, but when we do that, we are missing out on, on the guardrails that other people have put forward for us that can help us. Or it can be all about rules. But when we make Sabbath all about rules, what we are doing is just creating a new burden for you. That you miss God and a new way that you are trying to earn your own salvation. This is the chance for you to reconnect. This is the chance for you to be restored. This is the chance for you to follow not the rules, but the one who is ruler of the rules. Because Jesus says, I'm Lord of the Sabbath. I get to make the, call the shots on this. Our point is that Sabbath helps us to be shaped and formed more into Jesus' image, not so that we can check off the boxes to follow the rules more fully. Would you pray with me? God, we give thanks for all of those who have gone before us, who have set up guardrails of rules so that we know best how to follow you. But God, we also give thanks for the Holy Spirit, which sometimes leads us to go our own path. We pray, God, that you'll give us the wisdom to know which way to follow, where to turn. When we make mistakes, we, f we will fall on your grace. And when we rejoice and, fall and succeed, it will only be through your power and mercy. Make our focus in all things, not just Sabbath, be you, God. And may we be transformed by the power of your spirit and your love that flows through us. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.